There we go. So good morning from Wolfville, Nova Scotia, Oksana. It is 10 o'clock in the morning here, um, but it is not 10 o'clock with you. So you, coming to us from, from the United Kingdom. So it's, uh, I guess if my math is quick, it's about two o'clock in the afternoon for you. And uh, it's homecoming Sunday. Thank you so much for joining us here this morning, Oksana. Um, and we are going to just do a, a live check-in with you to see what, what you've been up to since Acadia. But before we get to that, um, of course, we had a, a short bio uh, posted in our social media and on our website about you. But wondering if you would start um, by just filling us a little bit in on where you were born and raised, a um, little bit about your early life. And then my next question, of course, is going to be how you how you ended up at Acadia. Hi, everyone. Really nice to see some familiar names, uh, perhaps not faces, but names. Uh, and indeed, I'm joining from London, UK, so it is 2 p.m. for me. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure um, to tell you a little bit about myself. So I grew up in Riga, Latvia, and I immigrated to Toronto uh, when I was 15. Um, and I think the story of getting to Acadia was probably one of my favorite things that I like to say, like I like to tell about this university. Um, I was already enrolled at a different school. I was at York. Uh, I'd already done a year of business administration there and I was happy uh, to go back. Uh, and it was end of August and I was on a cycling tour uh, with a group of 15 other people who wanted to promote environmental sustainability by cycling around Nova Scotia and New Brunswick and doing um, art theater uh, or um, yeah, just theater with using your bodies as props. So it was really good fun and one of the towns that we were cycling into was a town that I had never heard of before called Wolfville. Um, and the ride was very long, it was 90 kilometers. Uh, I had a lot of bags on my bike, uh, there were a lot of hills, so I cried. I cried on the way to Wolfville. Uh, <laughs> someone had to actually pick me up on a truck and drive me all the way up the murder hill uh, to Dr. Alan Warner's farm. Um, uh, he was a professor of a, of a university I didn't know existed, uh, but he hosted us on his farm and we uh, pitched tents um, with his cows. Uh, he fed us dinner, he made us ice cream from the milk of his cows, and over the course of us eating ice cream, I, I got to chat with him and ask him, what is this university all about? And he got to ask me what I was doing, and he said, oh, well, um, you know, Akiti is a really good university. You should consider just switching and coming here instead. And I thought, well, that's a ridiculous idea, but OK, I'll have a listen. Um, and, uh, you know, he said, well, I, I've got a professor of business who is a friend of mine, Edith Callahan. You should talk to her. Um, would you be open to that? And I thought, all right, yeah, sure, I'll talk to her. And Dr. Edith Callahan hosted me in her house for three hours the next day, talking to me about everything that she was teaching, what she was excited about, about the university. And uh, yeah, I think after that I was sold. Um, so I started looking into how do I transfer? And I think that's when I was taken to Una. Una, I think at that point you were doing something with admissions, if I remember correctly. Mm, right, this was many years ago. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I was the first year advisor. That's right. OK, yeah, so I must have gone to you and said, uh, I'd like to transfer. What does it take? Um, it seemed pretty easy and all of my credits were accepted and people were so welcoming. And I think you even helped me with finding my first home because it was already the last week of August and, you know, I couldn't get to residence. Um, and I called my parents and said I was transferring and a week later I was in Wolfville. Um, so that was that was that. So lots that I want to ask you from from that story. Of course, I'm kind of stuck on the ice cream that was made from the milk of Alan's cows because, wow, that's cool. Um, so what were you, what was your parents reaction when when you sort of filled them in on this story of what really sounds like randomness? <laughs> My, thankfully, my parents are quite trustworthy. Um, they did think it was a bit crazy, and I, I didn't hear the jaw drop, but I definitely could picture it. Um, they, they, at that point, they had already let me go to China for three months and to British Columbia for three months and on this crazy bike tour. So they did know that I was able to like keep myself alive uh, and make some decent decisions. So they thought, all right, well might as well let her go. One argument that I had with my dad um, was, 
you know, listen, Dad, you went to university and you had an amazing experience and you still keep talking about your university years 30 years later. I want that and I don't think I could have that at York. Um, and I think I could have that here. Don't you want that for me? And I think eventually that won him over. That is a that's a, a pretty good argument. <laughs> I'm not I'm not sure how any parent could respond any differently with that with being posed with that question. Well done you. So so now you're you found yourself at Acadia. It's late August. Um, tell me a little bit about the next few years and maybe some of your highlights while you were here. I think my highlights were both academic and non-academic. Um, I think what I what I appreciated the most academically speaking was that the um, the faculty and uh, administration were just so eager to make sure that they do the right thing for your dreams. It was an extremely personalized experience. Um, for example, I um, didn't want to take uh, one of the courses, even though the, it was a mandatory one, because I thought that I wouldn't benefit so much from it as I had had uh, some extracurricular things that I've done that certainly would have covered for that. So I remember going to the head of the business school at that time, Dr. Ian Hutchinson, and saying, listen, there's this other course that I'm way more interested in. Can I take that instead? And he just closed the door and said, don't make it public knowledge, but yes. <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, I, I was just amazed at the flexibility um, of the staff to uh, find a way for you to achieve your goals and your dreams and do what you thought was the right path for you. Um, and there were just so many examples of that. Um, I think at the end of my tenure, um, I wanted to run a, a Toastmasters club. Uh, and I, I started one uh, and I thought, my gosh, I don't think I can run a Toastmasters club and take a full course load. What if I make the Toastmasters club one of my um, courses and I, you know, do some research into entrepreneurship and social enterprise? And I spoke to uh, a couple of professors about it again and they thought, well, OK, yeah, I think we can do that and you can structure it. Obviously, I had to do some extra work like writing essays, reflections on what I was going through. Uh, but again, that was another example of the faculty working with me to enable me to to do what I thought was the right thing for my growth. Um, and of course, highlights like from non-academic experiences, I made um, amazing friends um, and I had a tremendous amount of fun. Um, I think, yeah, one of the best stories that I think I, I was thinking about recently was I, I went on a date with somebody. Um, I wasn't too fond of him, but I thought oh, I'll give it a go. Um, and I went to the library pub um, and on the way to the library pub, the guy that I was with met another friend of his who was also going on a date um, to the library pub. So we kind of, you know, it's, it's a small pub, so we ended up sitting together. And as I said, like I wasn't so fond of the guy, but I really liked the girl that went with on a date with the other guy. Um, so I think at the end of the date, we just decided to ditch the guys and have, have a great time on our own. And we're still friends until this day. Um, so yeah, I think that's one of the highlights. <laughs> <laughs> and that, you know, that's so typical being a small town, right? And having limited options of places to go on dates. So I'm not surprised to hear that story, but I'm sure a lot of people who went to much larger institutions would think, how does something like that happen? <laughs> And your 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 ex, um, experiences academically, I got to tell you, Oksana, I mean, you mentioned some heavy hitters there, right? When you, you talk about Alan and Edith and Ian, um, you know, having people like that involved. And, and again, it's one of those things that it's tough to explain to people. You know, it's, it's tough to really sort of get folks who didn't have the Akiti experience um, enough uh, idea and feel to be able to understand exactly what that means. But, you know, having been at Acadia myself, I know exactly what you're talking about in those conversations that lead you down a path you never thought you were gonna go. Absolutely, and I, I, in terms of Ian Hutchinson, I just remembered one story that I also wanted to share. I think one uh, one year before, um, this, when, the, before I qualified to apply for the Sobe Award, he spoke to me and said, listen, I think, I think you can do this. Let's start preparing what do you have to do this year so you can apply next year? I mean, who would do that? A yeah. year in advance, he started thinking about it. It was yeah. just amazing. That and, is. And, 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 and I won it with his help. And he thought, well, maybe you can um, get a reference letter from, from the president of the university. So I had a two hour session uh, with Ray Ivany at the time uh, just to, to talk about 
you know, my career, my life, what I want to do. Uh, where else are you going to get those kinds of experiences? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it, and it, you know, it warms my heart. Uh, and I'm sure everyone else who will see this video and this interview will warm their heart as well, because I think we probably all have similar stories, um, you know, with our Katie experience for sure. So you mentioned the Toastmaster Club, but I know there are a few other um, activities and, and groups that you were involved in on campus. So, so just give us a couple of more, because I know your time was pretty busy while you were here. It was ridiculously busy. I have no idea how I did it. Honestly, my days were 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. nonstop. Um, so I wrote for the Athenaeum. I was a features editor. Uh, I was uh, on the council for two years, I think, uh, as a deputy chair. Um, I also taught at the Writing Center. Um, that was, um, yeah, just helping students get their essays uh, from B to A, from C to B, etc. Um, just giving them some tools on how to improve their writing, uh, which was really cool because I'm an, I'm an immigrant myself and um, knowing that my understanding of the English language is occasionally helpful to people that um, were born in the country was just a really empowering thing. And I was really glad that um, the English professor that hired me saw that and gave me that chance. Um, yeah, I worked uh, with, uh, with Ax uh, Axby um doing some research i worked with alan warner doing a bit more research so yeah definitely definitely busy time and i hope you re reap the uh, benefits of more ice cream when you were working with alan as well <laughs> i do remember we were doing these um dinners uh we were hosting dinners um with i think it was all like vegan vegan food and uh, sharing recipes and i do remember there were some more super delicious um meals going around I bet, I bet. Um, Alan actually has just recently retired, but still is uh, obviously cycling through the community, still on a regular basis. So we still see him quite often. So you graduated from Acadia, and then what? What? What next? Give us, give us an idea of your next couple of steps before you landed where you are now. So actually, both of my subsequent steps were a result of somebody at Acadia helping me out. Um, the first job that I got was with uh, G.D. Irving um, in Moncton, New Brunswick. Somebody from uh, Irving's uh, message, the Career Center, saying, hey, have you got a few students graduating that are quite promising? Can you forward us some names? We would love to chat with them. So someone put my name out there um, and the recruiter reached out. And my first job was in Moncton, New Brunswick, and I was working for Midland Transport as a um, some kind of an analyst, project manager in essence. Um, so I did that for about a year, which was great fun and I learned a lot. Um, I never lived in, in New Brunswick before, so it was um, just another chance to explore the Maritimes. Um, and the next job was, again, a result of somebody at Acadia, again, helping me out. I did my thesis on microfinance, small loans to um, small scale entrepreneurs in developing countries. Um, so that's what I researched and knew very well. And I knew that I wanted to take my career in that on that path. Um, so when I wrote my thesis, uh, my honors professor, Dr. Kelly Dye, thought it was very good and that I should present it at the Atlantic Schools of Business um, Conference, which is normally open just to um, PhDs. Um, I think that's pretty much it, researchers. Um, and wasn't open to undergraduate students, but she thought it was quite good. So she thought, well, you know, you should apply anyway. And I did, and I, um, I got in. Uh, but it was in Prince, in Prince Edward Island in Charlottetown, so I didn't really have a way to get there. Um, and Dr. Kelly Dye said, well, you know, I think uh, Dr. Donna Sears is going there, so why don't you take a ride with her? Um, so Donna took me on that drive, and on that drive, she asked me what I wanted to do and about my research, and uh, I told her all about microfinance and how excited I was about it, and she, th she said, you know what, I think I think one of my students who did um, his thesis with me, I think he, he he's doing that. I think he's doing like a fellowship program on that. And I was like, yeah, that's a fellowship. That's the one I want. And he, she's like, oh, well, you should chat with him. Here's his contact information and you get in touch. And it turns out that he um, was living in Moncton, New Brunswick, which is where I was working for my first job. So, you know, I got I got in touch with him and he helped me through the application process for this fellowship. 
and um, I was sent to Central Asia, to Kyrgyzstan, to work in microfinance, uh, which is which was my dream. Uh, so I did that for a couple of years, working in a small town, small mountainous town in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it was strikingly beautiful. Uh, just imagine that country, 90% covered by mountains, snow caps everywhere, just nature, um, really welcoming people uh, and and um, just so much culture. It was really great. Um, so I, I worked with that organization actually for four years. Um, after uh, doing a gig in Kyrgyzstan, they sent me to a few, but like a few other places where that company was operating. So I spent some time in West Africa, I spent some time in Egypt. Um, uh, yeah, just all over. Uh, it was a fantastic experience. Um, but yeah, I, I, and I got into a, another area that I was super excited about, which is data and analytics. I really saw the rise of the importance of data um, and decided that I was going to pursue that um, more professionally uh, and get myself a master's degree, which I did in London in the UK, uh, which yeah uh, landed me here and I've been here ever since. So tell us about what you're doing here. So right after the uh, intern, uh, right after the masters, um, I, I got myself into this data science society. So I was co-running a data science society, um, and the recruiters were constantly reaching out to the society, asking, "Hey, do you have, um, you know, uh, data scientists to be? Um, we would like to recruit them." Um, and so we were running events for uh, all these companies that were reaching out to, the, to us. Um, and one of the companies that I reached out was Expedia. And I really liked the recruiter um, from that company. She was just a really nice person. And at some point she said, well, you know, you're, you're putting forward all these people. Why don't you apply? Um, so I did. Uh, and I got an internship there. I was at that point shifting, you know, shifting careers. So I knew I had to kind of drop back down to uh, intern level again. Um, and I was doing something else now. I was doing data, I was doing coding, uh, something that I'd never done with, you know, my previous microfinance career. Uh, so I got the internship there uh, at Expedia. I started working for Hotels.com brand. Uh, and yeah, I've been there for the past three years doing everything to do with data. Um, so whenever you come to any site, uh, be it Facebook or Amazon or whatever, obviously you do a bunch of activities on that side, you browse, you um, search for things, you book things, all of that behavior needs to be um, captured somehow uh, and recorded and then analyzed and then uh, based on insights about this behavior, the site can be improved or some marketing can be done um, based on your activity. Um, so that's what I've been doing at Expedia uh, and it's been an amazing journey because the space is changing so quickly. Um, uh, so it's always very exciting. Uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to certainly a few more years of growing in this field. You know, Oksana, you exude excitement and passion and just just in telling your story, it's it's incredible. And it's not surprising to me that you end up in these great conversations with these people who want to continue to connect you with other people and, and you know, offer you and provide you opportunities. It's absolutely wonderful. So you and your travel is just incredible. I mean, I'm sitting here in, in as much as I love little town, Wolfville, Nova Scotia, thinking how wonderful, how many places that you've been. That's incredible. So one piece of that equation that wasn't quite clear to me out of all the master's programs, how did you end up choosing one in, in the London, in London, UK? Well, I would say it was a pragmatic decision. So I wanted to do a degree that was um, from a good university that, you know, opens doors uh, because I knew that I was shifting careers um, and that it wouldn't be so easy. Uh, so I, I wanted to do something at a well-known university. So I considered places like Stanford or MIT, uh, but then I looked at the cost of those universities and that just didn't seem right. Um, and also uh, the programs there were two to three years. And I think it was uh, quite similar in terms of duration. Canadian universities for analytics, specifically for data analytics programs, were pretty much the same, two to three years. At that time, I was already 28. So I thought, mm, you know, taking a few years out of my life might not be the wisest choice. Um, and the UK was doing programs that were one year, one year long um, out of universities that were pretty good and well known, at least in Europe. Um, and I just decided to go for one of those. Um, yeah, it was it was really like um, an optimization 
um, type of decision. Makes a lot I, of sense. Yeah, I, I have to tell you though, I was really anti going to the UK. I had these preconceived notions of what it may be like. Um, I think Canadian culture is quite um, easygoing and everyone's very open and um, there is, it's just, it's just really nice and easy and I was used to it and I, 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 I was a bit fearful of what I might find in the UK, but I think I was um, much wrong <laughs> and I'm really happy here. That's and you know what? The weather is so much better. The weather's better? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Yeah, I think they I think they say that it rains a lot just so that too many people wouldn't come. <laughs> well, do you know what? That's a great segue into my next question. So when you were referencing some of your travel abroad, you, you talked about the beautiful mountains and the snow caps and you've talked about cycling and you're clearly an outdoor enthusiast. Um, and, you know, I've been to, to London a few times and obviously when I go, I do typically the touristy things. So Tell me a little bit about what you do when you're not working um, to, for enjoyment. Yeah, I think London is uh, like a mecca for somebody who is in their 20s, 30s and active and wants to, you know, see see what the city has to offer, but also what the outdoors has to offer because everything is really close by. You just hop on the train and you are, you know, you can be in Paris in two hours. Um, or you can also be somewhere in the north and um, in some in some wilderness. Uh, so it's great. Um, I think my, my time in London uh, has been... Uh, a combination of all these things. So uh, at some point I really got into musicals and the West End in London is just uh, unparalleled in terms of that. So I think in the last couple of years I must have seen, I don't know, 30, 40, I don't know, maybe something like that musicals. Um, so it's fantastic. Uh, you can just book tickets on the day, rock up um, and it, it's great. Uh, I also started dancing. Uh, I've always, you know, done some kind of dancing. I did gymnastics as a kid, um, and then I, I coached gymnastics at some point. I um, did a lot of like individual dancing, like lyrical, contemporary, hip hop, um, and then in Kyrgyzstan, actually, I tried out tango uh, because the the head of the Red Cross um, was a tango dancer, uh, and so she started teaching tango uh, in the courtyard of the Red Cross, um, and it was it was quite fun. Uh, and then it turned out when I went to Egypt to work from there, it turned out one of my colleagues was a tango dancer and I had nothing else to do. Uh, so I just went with her <laughs> and I really loved it. It was really, uh, it was good fun. And then it turned out in London, um, there are so many studios with phenomenal instructors. Um, so I really got into uh, Argentine tango here and I've been dancing, you know, now for a few years and I really enjoyed it. Uh, and I mean, yeah, we are in, in, uh, a situation where these activities are not exactly allowed at the moment, but I am looking forward uh, when they resume. So I've just had a great idea. We've been doing virtual events for Acadia since May, and I'm thinking that perhaps we should have Oksana Kovalenko on the list of scheduled events for some tango instruction. How do you feel about that? <laughs> <laughs> I, tell you what. I am willing to give everything a go you know everything can be tried at least once if it is complete failure we just don't do it again but you once know, gosh could you stop being so hard to get along with seriously <laughs> <laughs> so I just I, I have two more questions for you and uh, it's going to focus back on Acadia again um, so in a, in a few words describe to us your affinity or, or your relationship with Acadia as it currently stands I think, oh, uh, as in how am I involved with Acadia right now? Yeah. Okay. Well, I think I think it's, you know, there there is the past, right? The story that um, shaped me as a person because of Acadia. And for that, I'm, my affinity will always be like immense gratitude. Um, and in terms of my like, continual involvement, uh, what's really great about being in London is that um, Rod Morrison and his wife Linda often come here um, for uh, all kinds of fundraising events and other events and um, uh, it's always a chance for everyone who went to Acadia but now lives in the UK to gather and the nice thing is that every Acadian is so Acadian that they're <laughs> all gonna make time to come and gather as Acadians and have a wonderful evening. So every six months or so, um, we do gather here in London um, for some drinks and for some reminiscing, and it's always a wonderful time. 
That, that's awesome. That's amazing. And and I know that you uh, have met and crossed paths with a couple of times with Derek Smith. So he actually uh, was visiting his family in New Brunswick um, in, in recent weeks. So I got a chance to catch up with him as well. So that was that was absolutely wonderful. And my last question for you, Oksana, if I may, what would you say to somebody who is of the age that they're starting to think about universities? What would you say to somebody about that choice and uh, maybe even possibly considering Acadia? So I'd say I, I've gone myself, I've gone to three universities. I've gone to York, I've gone to Acadia and I've gone to Imperial here in London. And by far, Acadia was the place that made me the happiest. Uh, it was incredibly personalized. It was holistic. Um, I felt that people cared, people that shouldn't even have cared, but they still cared. Um, everyone just cared for your success. Um, so if you're the type of person that things that will benefit from um, just having great support. Um, do it like there isn't. I, I don't know. Maybe there are other schools that are as good. I haven't encountered one, <laughs> so <laughs> do it. Uh, you will you will not regret it. That's wonderful words and and uh, you know, similar in some ways to your experience was mine, but obviously very different in a lot of ways as well. Uh, but working here and, and uh, knowing that we have people like you who have those experiences, and, and many do, if not all. So it's it's really rewarding to know that Acadia plays a role in, in the life that you're leading right now and enjoying. And, and it's so wonderful to uh, to have caught up with you this morning. And, and I thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Um, and uh, I wish you all the best. And uh, hopefully we can be in touch again real, real soon, Oksana. Huge pleasure. Thank you so much for having me and giving me a chance to um, reminisce again about the wonderful years that Acadia gave me. I absolutely agree. Can't wait to catch up again. Take good care. Enjoy the rest of your day and enjoy the rest of your homecoming weekend. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye.